I'm a behavioral scientist and a professor of psychology, and the central purpose of my work is to teach people about the joy and sense of wonder that comes from thinking scientifically about the world around us. As we've heard today, scientists explore and discover, and what they do is creative and a little magical. But you can only be an effective scientist if you are willing to let go of certainty, to recognize that you begin from a position of ignorance, not knowing the answer, and you probe and test and wait to see where the path of nature takes you. Sometimes you won't find an answer. Some problems take a long time to figure out. But scientists are also patient. They're willing to leave things unknown, unfinished, and until such time as a convincing explanation can be found. Scientists also start out knowing that they're going to make mistakes. For example, I often teach introductory psychology, and I, I have one of these when I do it. And we used to teach this. For many years, we told students that they had four receptors for taste sweet, salty, sour, and bitter, and that they were arranged in a kind of map on your tongue, a kind of United States of your tongue. <laughs> we now know that, of course, this is completely wrong. There are, in fact, five receptors for taste, the fifth one being savory or umami, and the receptors are distributed more or less evenly throughout the tongue wherever there are taste buds. But mistakes are part of the scientific process. The word experiment suggests that failure is to be expected, and not all attempts will work. Sadly, in the life of a researcher, often many experiments fail. But the failures are also valuable because they teach us where not to go. Unfortunately, I've discovered that this particular mistake about the tongue is a hard one to undo. People seem to prefer the United States of your tongue idea to the one, one state with many flavors concept. But I'll keep trying. So I do behavioral research, and I teach students about science and human behavior, and I love every minute of it. I study irrational behavior, and as it turns out, there's an unlimited supply of irrational behavior. <laughs> I will never run out of things to study. But the longer I do this work, the more I have come to understand that words and evidence only go so far. Sometimes people will be convinced by new information and a good argument, but often they stubbornly cling to their old ideas. For whatever reason, sometimes the false story is more attractive than the true one. And so people go on believing in the United States of the tongue rather than the right picture. And the United States of the tongue is, at, is the least of our problems. Surprisingly large numbers of people hold much more important false beliefs. According to a recent poll, 48% of American adults, less than half, believe that humans developed out of other species. From the same poll, here is the trend of American adults who believe that astrology is scientific. Sadly, things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, I hope I'm not bursting any bubbles out there when I say that astrology isn't scientific. It does not hold up to the test. But lots of people still believe. For teachers of science, this is a humbling thought. People are sometimes swayed by a reasoned argument, and so we go on appealing to reason. But often they emerge from reasoned debate unscathed. I might be able to convince most people to abandon the United States of your tongue, but evolution and the weaknesses of astrology would be a much harder sell. Why? Because these beliefs tap into a much deeper part of people's lives that began many years ago. So here's the main point of my talk. Scientific thinking develops in environments that are both supportive and permissive. If we want to produce people who are interested in science and truth and not astrology and creationism, we need to let our children find their own way in the physical world, and in the world of ideas. My own case is an example. I grew up in the 1950s and early 1960s in a small suburb south of Chicago, Illinois, in a time when childhood was a very different thing than it is today. There were no computers, 
no video games, no cell phones, and far fewer scheduled activities for children. But there was something that few American children have today, freedom. From the time we were six or seven years old, my friends and I were allowed to spend whole days roaming around the neighborhood away from our parents' gaze. We had to come home when it got dark for, for, and for the occasional meal, but many hours a week were spent roaming free. None of this was unusual at the time, but my mother, who was, of course, the primary parent on duty, took it to another level. Not far from our house, was an undeveloped field. It's still there, <laughs> as this Google Earth photo shows. <clears throat> uh, it looks as though it's being farmed now, but at that time, it was filled with tall grass, and the grass was thick with non-poisonous garter snakes. My friends and I spent many a summer day walking through the grass in pursuit of snakes, and we caught lots of them. My mother, took a strangely casual attitude to all this. Far from being repulsed, she often allowed me to bring the snakes home, and when they inevitably got loose in the house, she took it in stride. Family lore has it that my mother once asked a dinner guest if he would be willing to help her move the refrigerator to one side so that she could retrieve a wayward reptile. <laughs> Later, when I was 10 years old, my friends discovered, a friend of mine discovered an old plank fence that had been torn down in our neighborhood, and the two of us carted off the wood and used it to build a crude roller, roller coaster. I believe this to be the only surviving photo of that structure, which, as you can see, attracted a lot of attention from the neighbor kids. Uh, let's see. This thing here is the wooden cart that would go down the hill. It had, it had roller skate wheels underneath it. Uh, this is the hill, and this is a little tunnel that we built for the car to go through. This structure probably represents the greatest achievement of my childhood. <clears throat> and yet, there are a few things that I should probably point out about it. First, it was dangerous. We actually had no idea what we were doing when we put it together. <laughs> we didn't get a building permit. No one came around to make safety inspections. Secondly, that's our backyard. Uh, not only did my mother let me build this crazy thing, which, as you can tell, is something of an eyesore, uh, but she let me build it in our backyard. This was a remarkably valuable childhood that I believe had much to do with the person I became. If we are to give children a sense of autonomy and competence, we need to face our adult fears and let our children go out into the world and face theirs. It is worth, worth noting that I was actually quite fearful of roller coasters. I still am. But for whatever reason, I chose and was allowed to take on this fear uh, in my own backyard. My life as a scientist began in the neighborhood surrounding my house in the suburbs. I was lucky because I came from an economically secure, middle-class family. I had loving parents, food, shelter, and good public schools to attend. But it's interesting to note that I have almost no memory of school. My most important memories of this period are of the roller coaster and the snakes, things that happened when I was on my own outside my house. Much of what I've become today is due to the permissiveness of my parents, primarily my mother. Of course, I was required to do my homework and complete my chores and generally follow the rules that were set out for my brother and me. But whenever I wanted to try something new or take on a project, my mother would always say yes. When I was young, my mother gave me the freedom to explore the physical world, and as I got older, she gave me the freedom to explore the intellectual world, too. My parents had not been particularly religious, and they never tried to impose their beliefs on me. They were avid readers, and we had many great discussions about the issues of the day, but they never had a pat answer, and they never tried to get me to adhere to any one point of view. It was an exceptional childhood, a childhood that few children get today, and my mother was a big part of it. I should say that my mother is in the audience today, and she had no idea I was going to say any of this. So perhaps now is the time to say publicly 
Thank you, Mom, for being such a wonderfully permissive parent. I was lucky to have the parents I did, but I was also lucky to grow up at, the, at, a, at that particular time in history. When the picture of the roller coaster was taken, President John F. Kennedy had been in office for just seven months, and the United States was in the midst of a space race that we were clearly losing. Four months before this picture was taken, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space and the first person to orbit the Earth. A year after the picture was taken, Kennedy would make his famous We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, challenging the nation to send an astronaut to the moon by the end of the 1960s. In his speech, President Kennedy called the nation to collective action with a higher moral purpose. He called the trip to the moon the greatest adventure of human history, and he said we were going there for the progress of all people. Of course, the space race was part of a larger Cold War and a nuclear arms race that had us all very worried. So there were military and political motives behind the space race, and Kennedy made mention of technological and industrial benefits too. But as a child, I was far less aware of this. To me, space was the great adventure that Kennedy talked about, and like many kids at that time, I was fascinated with satellites and astronauts. And I was fortunate to have parents who nurtured my interest in science, sometimes with troubling results. One day, when the family cat brought home a dead bird, I proceeded to dissect the still warm creature on my desk blotter. <laughs> but it was an exciting time in history, and I was drawn to the basic gee whiz of science, the excitement of learning and exploration. That moment in history created a renewed emphasis on science and mathematics, and I benefited from that atmosphere. We are seeing another renewed emphasis on science education today, but there's something very different about the current appeal to discovery. Compare Kennedy's speech with the current emphasis on STEM education, education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If you go to the US Department of Education website, this is what you see. The projected numbers of jobs in STEM fields. President Obama's Educate to Innovate program is quite explicitly designed to promote science as the engine of business innovation and economic growth. This is a very different appeal to science. This is the government promoting science in the service of business and the economy. To be certain, getting a job is important. Having a strong economy is important. My childhood was made possible by the fact that my parents were always employed. But the emphasis on STEM fields is not an approach that calls the mind to play. It is not an inspirational challenge of discovery and collective achievement for a higher moral purpose. It is largely a call to industrial and technological success. In what I believe to be a sad transformation, much of the contemporary view of science has changed it from an intellectual enterprise to an economic one, and from play into work. So if having an inquisitive mind that values evidence and scientific reasoning comes from permissive and supportive environments, then what should we do about it? First, we need to let our children run free. We need to find ways for children to go out into the world and play with other kids and devise their own societies, build their own cities, and discover how things work. This kind of play is so rare today, and wherever possible, we need to bring it back. Not everyone is lucky enough to grow up in a safe neighborhood, and that is a problem that needs to be addressed, too. But we parents need to recognize that the problem is often more about our fears than it is about our children's safety. Just this month, Hannah Rosen wrote a wonderful piece in the Atlantic Monthly suggesting that we should go back to the kind of play children have engaged in for centuries before the modern era. It is also important to give children a sense of intellectual freedom. We must resist the temptation to mold our children into little versions of ourselves. Chances are we will fail anyway. Instead, we need to give children a sense of autonomy, create homes where reason debate is valued. It's important to make 
a safe base from which they can ex explore the world. Finally, we need to infect our children with the joy of discovery and a fascination with science. Going to the moon was kind of a crazy idea. It was very expensive and it didn't have much economic impact, but it captured the imagination of the nation and inspired a generation of young people. There is no one providing that kind of political leadership today, but there are people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bob Ballard who can inspire us. We need to make sure that all children come into contact with teachers of science who can, who can convey the pure joy and, of discovery and understanding. And all of this is important because when the next big discovery comes along, it might not have a great bottom line. It might not fit into anyone's business plan, but it just might change things for all of us and make our lives better and more meaningful. And when that discovery comes, it's likely to be brought to us by someone whose parents said yes and let them run free in the great green, grassy field of ideas. Thank you.